Resuming debate, the uh, Honourable Member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Conservative government uh, is formally, at least today, seeking from all of us in this place our support for extending and expanding Canada's military mission against the Islamic State of Iraq in the Levant, commonly known as ISIL. With this motion, Mr. Speaker, the government is asking that we agree to continue to put men and women of Canada's armed forces in harm's way in Iraq and over, if not in, Syria. That harm may find them, Mr. Speaker, is most obvious now in the wake of the recent and tragic death of Sergeant Duaron. May he rest in peace and may those that knew him and loved him find solace in some way. And may his life and his fate be at the forefront of our minds, Mr. Speaker, as we consider this motion. And Mr. Speaker, not just Sergeant Duaron's life, but let us also think about the 158 Canadians who died in the service to this country in our war in Afghanistan, about the thousands who were injured, about the thousands more who will wrestle forever with post-traumatic stress disorder, and about those who couldn't live any longer with the experience or memory of their service in Afghanistan and took their own lives. This is the inevitability of war, Mr. Speaker. This is what the Conservative government is asking us to accept with this motion. This debate, then, is about our responsibility for their lives, the lives of the men and women of our armed forces. Sometimes, Mr. Speaker, circumstances warrant our approval of military action. History, including our own Canadian history of military action, tells us that sometimes circumstances warrant that we say yes, knowing that those who go into military action on behalf of this country may not come back whole, if at all. It follows, Mr. Speaker, that a few important requirements need to be met before yes can be the answer before support for military action can be forthcoming. But the first and most, most fundamental of these, Mr. Speaker, is trust. Trust in the government, trust that the government will abide by the language of the motion before us, trust that it will hold sacred the consent and the limits to that consent as set out in the motion before us, given to it by this House. Well, we know the answer to this question, Mr. Speaker. It has been provided to us many times over in many ways. But we need not reach any further than this matter, this mission, before us. This House has been misled, Mr. Speaker, and the consent provided by this House for the mission to date has been abused. On September 4th, the Prime Minister announced the deployment of several dozen military advisors for up to 30 days to help the Kurds in Iraq. We were told that this was an advise and assist mission, Mr. Speaker. On September 30th, the Prime Minister tells us here in this House that Canadian soldiers are not accompanying the Iraqi forces into combat. Over and over again, in so many different ways, the Prime Minister has been asked in this House about the role of Canadian ground troops in Iraq, about the engagement of Canadian ground troops in combat. Over and over again in this House, we were told that they were not, that they would not be so engaged. By February, Mr. Speaker, it became clear the answers provided by the government, by the Prime Minister himself, were not true. Canadian soldiers providing ground support to airstrikes exchanged fire with ISIL ground units. At least three such firefights were reported between the end of January and mid-February. And now, Mr. Speaker, we are being asked to approve a motion that, quote, notes that the government continues not to deploy troops in a ground combat role. We know that not to be true, Mr. Speaker. The government knows that not to be true. We've had ministers rise in this House to acknowledge the engagement of Canadian soldiers in ground combat. We've had the death of Sergeant Duaron to confirm this truth for us. What it betrays, Mr. Speaker, is a government that is not just untrustworthy, but takes far too lightly its responsibilities. A government that falls far, far short of its responsibility to deal with this matter with the seriousness it deserves. It is not just, not nearly just about planting this strange clause about combat uh, troops in the motion, Mr. Speaker. The issue extends to the reference in the motion to UN Security Council Resolution 2178. Its reference suggests, Mr. Speaker, that that resolution is somehow in support of this mission, that the United Nations Security Council Resolution somehow confers support for this mission or legitimizes it. 
But, Mr. Speaker, Resolution 2178 deals with the issue of the travel of terrorists and the financing of terrorism. Moreover, on the matter of the conduct of this government to date and the proposed extension and expansion of this mission, it is difficult to read into the resolution anything other than contradiction to the motion in which it is embedded. It recognizes, for instance, that international cooperation and any measure taken by member states to prevent and combat terrorism must comply fully with the Charter of the United Nations. It reaffirms respect for the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of all states in accordance with the Charter. It further reaffirms, and here I quote at length, Mr. Speaker, that member states must ensure that any measures taken to counter terrorism comply with all their obligations under international law, in particular international human rights law, refugee law, humanitarian law, underscoring that respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms, and the rule of law are complementary and mutually reinforcing with effective counterterrorism measures and are an essential part of a successful counterterrorism effort and notes the importance of respect for the rule of law so as to effectively prevent and combat terrorism and noting that failure to comply with these and other international obligations, including under the Charter of the United Nations, is one of the factors contributing to increased radicalization and fosters a sense of impunity. Now, we have asked the Prime Minister and ministers of this government, Mr. Speaker, whether they have in fact complied with their legal obligations under international law. In response to that question from the Leader of the Official Opposition, a question that arises straight from the text of the Security Council resolution embedded in their motion, the Prime Minister saw fit to crack on wise about ISIL lawyers. I quote the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker. I am not sure what point the leader of the NDP is ultimately making. If he is suggesting that there is any significant legal risk of lawyers from ISIL taking the Government of Canada to court and winning, the Government of Canada's view is that the chances of that are negligible." End quote, Mr. Speaker. While he sends our Canadian Armed Forces around the world to stand up for the rule of law, while he cites in this motion the Security Council resolution reaffirming it, we have a Prime Minister who flouts the rule of law, who openly mocks it in our Parliament. One final point, Mr. Speaker, about the text of the resolution as it relates to the motion. It tells us not only that compliance with international legal obligations is mandatory, it explains why. It is the view of the Security Council, as reflected in this resolution, that compliance with international law complements and reinforces effective counterterrorism measures, and that the converse is also true, that the failure to comply with international obligations, including under the Charter of the United Nations, is, quote, one of the factors contributing to the increased radicalization and fosters a sense of impunity. It is perhaps an obvious point, Mr. Speaker, it has not escaped the attention of so many analysts of these circumstances that it is in the context of tearing down state institutions and tearing asunder civil society that we provide fertile ground for radicalization. Surely we have witnessed this enough times that not hundreds of thousands of troops on the ground, much less bombs from on high, is the prescription for peaceful development and security. Canada must respond differently from now on, and we must accordingly say no to this main motion and support the motion as amended by the NDP. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.